Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this new lecture, Race and Racism. Race is a very important topic for anthropologists. It is also a very important topic for sociologists and for all of us living in our modern society. So in this chapter, we will try to understand what is race and what is racism. It's going to be a short chapter. I just want us to explore the notion of race for anthropology and how we can try to um, make the world a safer place by understanding better what do people mean when they talk about different races. I would like first to start with a question that uh, I'm asking you. Do you think we can tell somebody's race by looking at him or her? Do you think by just looking at physical appearance, you can guess what is the race of the person and where is that person coming from? And, um, and the answer I would like to, uh, to give me is that no, we cannot predict certainly where a person is coming from by just looking at him or her. Even skin color, perhaps more frequently imagined to demarcate separate races. In fact, it varies so gradually over geographic space that there are no clear boundaries between one population and another nor color groupings that distinguish one population from another. So what can you know about a person's genetic makeup based on his or her outlook appearance? Actually, variations of skin color or other visible characteristics often associated with race are shaped by less than 0.1% of our genetic code. So contrary to certain stereotypes, they do not predict anything else about a person's genetic makeup, physical or mental capabilities, culture or personality. So no, we cannot say where a person is coming from by just looking at his face or her face. Uh, we have all been enculturated to believe that a very small number of traits, including skin color, hair texture, eye color, or shape can serve to categorize people into distinct groups and predict larger genetic patterns. But actually, this is a flawed assumption. This is an unrelevant uh, assumption. So let's try now to understand the concept of race. And the two questions that derived from the first one I asked you are do biologically separate races exist and how is race constructed around the world I posted on the google classroom a very interesting uh, video i would like all of you please to watch this video it's a project that has been done by the american anthropological association triple a like we call it and it's uh, so it's a project with uh, that led to a documentary and also exhibitions around the US and this project uh, tries to understand the concept of race in the US and it's entitled race are we so different so here it uses um different different um views on race so the anthropological one but also the biological one and uh, it discusses how did race become what it means for us today so how the concept of race has been constructed over uh, the centuries over the years and it discusses of course the term race itself and what does it mean so you should all keep in mind and um, remember the main outcome uh, out of this project is that race is not fixed in nature but is created it's perpetrated and it changed by people through individual and collective action so if you trace your own family back for 30 generations 
parents to grandparents to great grandparents and so on, you will find that in less than 1000 years, you have accumulated 1 billion relatives. So can you imagine? It means that somehow we are all mixed to one another. So here, we cannot divide people by their race, since, you know, we have all been, um, not all of us mixed, but all of us had experienced diversity in our uh, genetic background. So race appears to be a social construction and it appears to be an unrelevant way to distinguish people. However, since it is used in our modern society, it is important for us anthropologists to look at what does it mean for people. Before we do that, uh, let's talk a little bit about physical anthropology. If you have studied biological anthropology, or also called physical anthropology, you know that Homo sapiens, us humans, share um, approximately 99.9 .9 of our genetic pool. So we have apparently, we have, sorry, 99.9% uh, .9 of the same DNA. So again, if you think of your family tree, it would be at least 1 billion relatives. And if you take the DNA, it means that we are somehow very close to each other and uh, we share a lot of uh, common features and traits. It means again then that we have been enculturated to believe that a very small number of traits, uh, like I said, skin color, hair texture and eye color and shape, can serve to categorize people into distinct groups and predict larger genetic patterns. So um, you have to think of our human history, or at least the modern human history. It is um, more than 200,000 years. So imagine again how we have been um, how we have been intertwined. So race here is not clear and um, there is no absolute genetic lines that can be drawn to separate people into distant, biologically discrete racial populations. Now saying that, the question is why? Why are race created? I'm sure you have an opinion on that and maybe you have answers to that. Um, it has been created, if you remember the video you watched, to justify the conquest, enslavement, forced transportation, and economic and political domination of some humans by others. So information on race is usually used to dominate others. And it's actually very recent that race is used to divide people. Before, in the past, it wasn't race that was used as a, a distinctive um, marker, but it was rather um, the social status or the economic uh, status, the wealth and the religion. It's still somehow a way to divide people, but race uh, has replaced by far um, these two criteria. Quickly, let's continue on uh, the physical anthropology part. Here, I just would like to uh, let you know about the distinction between genotype and phenotype. So genotype refers to the inherited genetic factors that provide the framework for an organism's physical form. So uh, usually it would be what we call DNA, and it's something that we inherited. So there are the cells that we inherited from our parents and grandparents and so on, and that we will also pass on to the next generation. Now the phenotype is the way genes are expressed in an organism's physical form as a result of genotype interaction, 
with environmental factors. And sometimes based on the environmental factors, you know, nutrition, disease, stress, and so on, the genotype can be modified by the environment. So genotype equals the uh, genetical, the genetic formed, and phenotype is the genetic plus the environment. And it refers to uh, the physical appearance and how the environment can affect that. Let's look here at this research done by an American anthropology who tried to show how inaccurate the concept of race is by, um, by telling the people to try to imagine what if we divide the people based on their earwax. Yes, because from a genetic viewpoint, the use of skin color as the primary variable in constructing a person's race appears to be quite arbitrary. So why not choose eye color, hairiness, uh, earlobe shape, fingerprints, nose shape, tongue rolling, you know, the ability to roll your tongue. Um, by the way, not anyone can, uh, not everybody can do that. Uh, tooth shape or size, double joint fingers, uh, weight, height, anything possible. And why not earwax? So can you imagine hierarchical systems of race that affect distribution of power and resources and that are based on differences in earwax? What if students in your college were, or what is employees in your work were guaranteed individual tutoring by the instructor if they had wet earwax because apparently there are two types of earwax a dry gray and crumbly earwax and a wet yellow and stinky earwax so just to show you just to illustrate that um, dividing people based on their race based on their skin color based on their hair texture based on their eyes color is not well is an as unrelevant as dividing people based on their earwax and now the problem is with um, you know this division between people based on their races is that it creates racism and uh, here i just wanted to give you a broad definition of what racism is so it is basically individuals' uh, thoughts and actions and institutional patterns and policies that create or reproduce an equal access to power, privilege, resources, and opportunities based on imagined differences between groups. All right, and this part is important. Imagine differences between group. So it means that racism is a consequences of this distinction between people. Dividing people between different races can lead to, um, to uh, racism and to unequal treatment between different types of people. How did it start it? Very quickly, that's the last slide here. Um, it basically started along with colonialism and it was uh, even before institutionalized uh, colonialism so colonialism became the centerpiece of european global economic activity combining economic military and political control of people and places to fuel europe's economic expansion and to enhance the the european position in this um, in the emerging global economy so here, the classification of people based on phenotype, right, particularly skin color, became the key framework for creating a hierarchy for races. We've, of course, well, of course, um, you have all noticed that with Europeans at the top. So with 
white skin uh, color at the top that linked, you know, people's looks with assumptions about their intelligence, their physical abilities, their capacity for culture and basic words. So eventually, uh, this framework served to justify colonial contest, conquest. Sorry. If you think of the transatlantic slave trade and the eradication of much of the, the indigenous population of the Americas or in Australia as well, um, that's, uh, that's a big consequences of colonialism. So here uh, it started again with um, probably Christopher Columbus, who was uh, the first European to travel across the Atlantic Ocean from Europe to uh, what he thought was India, but was actually um, actual uh, Dominican Republic. And from that time, 19, um, sorry, 1492, so 15th century, until uh, pretty much today, but until the 20th century, then um, race has dominated our way, our perception of the world. So taking a global perspective, anthropologists often refer to racism in the plural, racisms. Um, because it reflects the, vari the varieties of ways race has been constructed among people in different places. This is something also important to keep in mind, is that race is not defined in the same term everywhere. All right, so <clears throat> the concept of race is different in the US and it's different in um, the UK and in France because it's directly related to the history of the place and uh, each society has its own definition and perception of what race is. So locally, racism and systems of racial classification are complex frameworks built out of the encounter of colonialism with local culture patterns, global migration, and specific movements also of resistance. So uh, we should, you know, we should bear that um, in mind. Um, so if you look at, you know, for example, what happened in uh, South Africa, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, uh, it's also interesting to see that, you know, it was a fight against uh, decades, centuries of uh, domination. And also the civil rights movement in the US, it challenged, you know, that 300 years of race uh, based inequality in the United States. And today globalization has brought about new experiences also of race and racism. And I guess we are all, um, you know, inclined to change that and to pay attention to that. So here, uh, Western Europe, so Western Eu Europe colonized Africa, Asia, the Pacific and the Americas, and they, it, you know, it placed them into an international hierarchy of races, colors, religions, and culture. So it splits into groups, sorry, um, into the assumption of natural differences in intelligence, attractiveness, capacity to civilization. All right. But of course, this is completely uh, inaccurate. And we cannot divide people based on the way we look. And that's the conclusion for this chapter. I thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very nice day.